Christine Lagarde, direktorica mednarodnega denarnega sklada na vprašanje, ali jo kaj teži trpljenje grških državljanov. Ne. Pomislim na majhne otroke iz šole v majhni vasici v Nigru, ki so deležni dveh ur po uka na dan, ki si po trije delijo en stov in ki si srčno želijo iz obrazve. Ne prestano mislim na njih, ker menim, da potrebujejo še več pomoči kot ljudje v Atenah. In kako naj se Grki poberejo iz krize? Tako, da plačajo davke. Kaj pa, volitve? Nekdo je nekoč rekel, da če ljudstvo ni zadovoljno z vlado, je treba pač zamenjati ljudstvo. 16-letnik Delovsko-Pankarske univerze. Letošnja tema – dvojna kriza evrointegracij. Thanks for the invite. I have to. Sorry, this setup is a bit weird. I feel like I'm going to be playing a, a concert piano or something with the lights. But thank you for the invite anyway, and, and I apologise. It's all uh, going to be in English, but but stop me if I if I go too fast at, at any point. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, three things really, three interrelated things. Um, the crisis in the eurozone in particular. Uh, the the crisis of capitalism in general and what we can do about it. Now obviously that's quite a bit to, to get into an hour or so, so this is going to be extremely uh, curtailed in several senses, but I did want to start with the context to what's happening in Europe in particular, right the way across the world, but especially in Europe, especially in the older, more developed parts of capitalism where the consequences of the crash of 2008, and really if you want to talk about um, what we're facing today, economically, your starting point has to be uh, the crash over 2007 into 2008, culminating in the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. Um, at the time, Lehman Brothers was, what, the third, fourth largest investment bank in the US, uh, filed for bankruptcy on the 15th of September 2008. Uh, the largest corporate bankruptcy in, in US history. Essentially, this vast bank disappeared overnight, realizing that it, it simply couldn't maintain the incredible level of bad debts and toxic assets that it had built up, or that it had realized it had built up as the boom uh, uh, played itself out. And, and that's the legacy, that's the primary legacy that all of the developed world is now carrying with it. And I, and I talk about the developed world, the older bits of capitalism in particular, because a lot of the dynamics of this um, don't really apply to, to anything like the same extent or, or anything like the same way. The mediations of it are, are somewhat different if you happen to be standing in Beijing than if you're, if you're standing in Athens or if you're in London, uh, for that matter. The crisis uh, plays itself out rather differently. And of course, the, the English word, at least, crisis, is, is not quite right for this. Crisis implies something short and sharp and sudden, something that um, turns up dramatically and then goes away equally dramatically. And one of the critical bits here, and actually you can see this steady realisation dawning, certainly on most of, of Europe's uh, ruling class, I mean, even our, our dear uh, George Osborne in, in London it is gradually getting his head around this one. That what we're looking at is not in any sense the usual round of recession uh, in capitalism, the usual crisis in which the system falls over itself, or maybe doesn't fall over itself, just sort of slows down a bit. Unemployment goes up, uh, and then everybody dusts themselves down. Um, the animal spirits, to quote Keynes, revive. Uh, the system picks up once more, and everything carries on much the same as it was previously. The, you know, this is like breathing. The thing goes down, the thing goes up. It doesn't really uh, alter anything fun fundamental about the system. Of course, what we're looking at now is something very, very different to that. So in that sense, it isn't a crisis. It's more like uh, a malaise or, or a long, drawn-out terminal uh, decline would be a better way uh, of describing this, but we're, we're stuck with the, the words we have rather than we're stuck with a immediate that refers to a crisis rather than you know the slow death of capitalism, which might be a, a more useful way to think about things. However, start with the crash of 2008. The crash of 2008 happens essentially at the end of, certainly for, for Britain, certainly for the Anglo-Saxon world, to a lesser extent uh, across the rest of the EU, uh, and, and you know, slightly wider than that, although there's variations on the theme here, um, that you're at the end of essentially the largest credit boom uh, in history. That it's very hard to think of a period, you're, you're dragging yourself way back into arguable periods of prehistory where the expansion of credit was that large and that sustained over such a significant period of time. Uh, a lie to, of course, a revision 
or a rewriting of the economic script, or an attempted rewriting of it, that's on the level of formal economic theory, uh, came through as something that liked to label itself the new macroeconomic consensus. And certainly, if you had the, the misfortune to, to study uh, economics at really any university department over the period of the boom, you'd have the misfortune to be confronted by um, what now, well, what at the time seemed pretty smug and, and now look both smug and stupid set of assumptions uh, that essentially all the major problems in capitalism have been solved. They've been solved by a combination of kind of technical problems that the theory of economics, the refinement of the neoclassical worldview, the vision of society as consisting of atomized individuals are that freely trade with each other and a free market kind of organizes them all, and that we have some very sophisticated mathematical, seemingly uh, sophisticated mathematical models to describe how an aggregation of these atomized individuals behave. Uh, that's the technical prowess allied to governments that have given up any, any silly old-fashioned ideas, forget socialism, but have certainly given up any silly old-fashioned ideas of consistent intervention into the economy, that the most any government can plausibly hope to do is create a kind of level playing field for the atomized individuals, for the free markets, for individual enterprises to kind of play themselves out on. And you have a, a central bank that's independent, and you deregulate as far as possible uh, your financial systems. And this is, the, this is the setup. This is, in theory, the new macroeconomic consensus, uh, free markets, independent central bank, deregulated finance. And in the world of politics, familiar, I think, is, is neoliberalism. And it's the apogee of neoliberalism. Unusually, of course, and I'll return to, to this point, the apogee of neoliberalism in Britain and in Germany uh, and in France, at least for the sort of big European countries, coincides uh, with the uh, governments of the left, or notionally of the left. Governments that aim to take um, the neoliberal project that they've inherited from the governments of Thatcher or Curl or actually Mitterrand, I suppose, in, in France, uh, or Reagan, if you wander over to the US, take over the neoliberal project, dust it down a bit, uh, and give it a, give it a human face, so neoliberalism with a human face. That you can have free markets, yes, of course, but you can also have uh, a functioning welfare state to a minimal extent. There is some degree of reforms involved here. Your living standards will seemingly increase. Your house price certainly will, will increase for the entirety of this period. You can ignore the massive amounts of debt that are stacking up uh, on the other side of the balance sheet at this point in time because the future prospects look so good and everything appears to be ticking along very, very nicely. This boom develops. It builds up really from, certainly in Britain, from the late 70s, early 80s in the US from a similar time period later uh, for countries moving into the neoliberal frame uh, later than that, most obviously, of course, in Eastern Europe, post-1989, that neoliberalism develops over this period a set of policy responses that at their heart place both uh, financialization, so simply the deregulation of finance, the allowing of banks and major financial institutions off the leash, that they are allowed in a way they weren't in the preceding decades, certainly since the end of the Second World War. They're allowed off the leash. They're allowed to behave in ways that, that would have been not just unacceptable, but essentially illegal uh, in an earlier period of time. So London becomes the, the past master of this. It becomes a deliberate part of policy that London is, is kind of like the Wild West for financial dealing. And you can see the consequences of this now, of course, that any major scandal that erupts that involves high finance has roots that you can trace back to people sitting on desks in London because the thing is wildly unregulated, uh, almost entirely untaxed, and essentially bankers are, are allowed to do whatever they like. This is a, a critical part of the, the neoliberal settlement. That's one part of it. The other side of it, of course, is the, the more brutal side of neoliberalism, which is a deliberate attempt with varying degrees of success. Um, Thatcher in Britain actually not that successful, Blair more successful, um, with varying degrees of success to push back in real wages. A very, very crude attempt to restore profitability, to shift the balance of wealth and income in the economy away from the people who produce it, away from the majority population and towards uh, what Occupy, I think, helpfully labelled the top 1%, although in practice you're probably actually talking about the top 0.1% of the population, to transfer wealth in that direction, a squeeze on real incomes and real uh, standards of living, allied to the potential 
uh, for finance to create debt. And what you get under governments, notably of the left, in the developed world, at the apogee of neoliberalism, at the peak of this neoliberal period, the point at which the boom accelerates, the point at which neoliberalism appears completely embedded as a way of managing capitalism, right the way across the world, but of course with its dead centre uh, in the Anglo-Saxon economies, that uh, at the peak of this uh, process you get a sharp decline in some cases and certainly a stagnation of real incomes, your actual income. Uh, for the majority of population, so Britain, median income stagnate um, from the period 2002 to 2008, to stagnate or fall slightly. Uh, in the US, average hourly wages uh, fall from 1975 to 1995, recover slightly, and are now somewhat lower than they were in 1973. So essentially that's you know, 40 years of progress sort of wiped out in terms of real increases in living standards. But th this is disguised by the process of debt creation on a colossal scale. Um, so keep referring to Britain probably because I know it best, but similar processes happen everywhere that liberalises its, its financial system to the degree to which they, they liberalise. In, in the case of Britain, average household debt rises from about 40% of disposable income in the mid-1980s to about 163, 170% by 2008. So households take on huge amounts of debt, essentially as a means of compensating for the decline in living standards. The declining living standards that is partly intentional. The government's quite deliberately set out to do this. They deliberately tear up labour market protections. They attempt as far as possible to weaken and undermine trade unions, which is the most obvious single barrier uh, against the decline in living standards for most people. That this happens intentionally to some extent, and somewhat unintentionally, or at least as a second order impact from, from globalisation, from the opening of trade, from competition, uh, from newly industrialising countries el elsewhere in the world. So those are the two impacts there. That are compensated through the creation of debt. Debt is created on uh, an immense scale that allows the living standards to be maintained, allows the apparent boom to take place, the extraordinary complacency of actually a bunch of people who are still in charge essentially. Uh, Mervyn King, governor of the Bank of England, referred to in the mid 2000s, um, the 2000s, the nice decade, the non inflationary continual expansion decade. It's another example of, uh, of how smug uh, you can get about these things. That everything seems resolved, everything's going to be fine forevermore. Ignore uh, the asset price bubble, the massive rise in house prices, ignore the accelerating. Uh, pile of debt, ignore too uh, the decline in real incomes for, for most people. So this process goes on. Now the trouble you've got of course in debt is, is that, to, to put it at its simplest, is that all debt is always a claim on future income. And if your future income cannot meet those claims, you will at some point hit a crisis. The best description of this process for, for the macro economy, for the whole economy, uh, was provided by Hyman Minsky in his, his uh, financial fragility uh, hypothesis, where he would talked about, and this predates the boom, I mean Minsky died before, before the boom really got going, um, what he talked about, I think, correctly identified the process by which, as you expand credit, of necessity, the debt that you're creating is being given to people who are less and less able to actually bear that debt, to actually carry that debt, because you start with the least risky prospects, you go to the people, or people come to you and say, we would like to borrow some money, and you make sure as a bank as a creative credit, you make sure it goes to the least risky prospects first, and then as the total mass of credit expands, it kind of inevitably runs out of the least risky prospects and gets to more and more risky ones. And of course, and I, I suspect this is a familiar story, this is precisely the tipping point in the credit bubble, which was always going to collapse at some point. It's the nature of the expansion of credit to this scale, ahead of real incomes, that it has to collapse. The real incomes are not keeping up with the expansion of credit. The thing has to collapse at some point. All debt is a claim of future income. If your future income is rising less fast or even falling relative to your debt piling up, the thing has to collapse at some point. The collapse in the US was of course provoked by subprime mortgages, um, the very poorest people in American society, uh, sold mortgages by, by cowboy dealers, by people who you know, convinced some poor, desperate individuals that even though you had, in many cases, no job, uh, no other income, no assets to speak of, you could still have a mortgage, you could still own a house, you could still be part of the American dream. 
Of course, when you lend to people who have no income, pretty much inevitably, they are not able to repay those debts and, of course, the, the thing collapses. The particular nature of the collapse is that because of the entanglement inside this bubble of the major financial institutions, because as the bubble developed, it, be it both became more risky and more complex, that as the thing appeared to expand, you get large institutions like Lehman Brothers or RBS or UBS or go through the list of acronyms uh, that entangle themselves in this process under, of course, the conviction that they are managing the process, that they're employing enough PhDs in maths and physics, they're spending a small fortune on computer power, that that means they are managing the process, which means that they can carry on expanding the bubble, which means they have nothing to worry about until, of course, they have something very much to worry about when the bubble collapses and the extraordinary complexity of their risk management operations gets exposed essentially for the sham it is, and you get the, the breakout of the financial crisis uh, accelerating from 2007, becoming unavoidable uh, from, from 2008. Now, that, that's the kind of background uh, to where we've got at the moment. That's the financial part of where we've got at the moment. Well, I wanted to address particularly what this says uh, about Europe and why it is that Europe and the Eurozone is the absolute dead centre and remains the dead centre, uh, the, the focus, the focal point of the crisis. And this gets us into, a, I think, a, a set of institutional uh, arrangements and a necessary analysis of institutional arrangements inside Europe to understand why things are going so badly wrong here. This is, of course, exactly the point that you can't deal with a recession or a crash on this scale simply by assuming everything goes back to normal at some point, which has, until at least now, been the kind of operating procedure that most of the world's ruling classes have operated under. It is only slowly dawning on them that there is no real return to business as usual, that this is not a case of a few tweaks before everything gets reset, but actually this is a deep institutional crisis with a focus in the Eurozone precisely because of the institutional uh, setup there. And the focus in the Eurozone boils down to, I think, essentially uh, its nature as of the single currency as a neoliberal project, as a fundamentally neoliberal project, as a project that was never intended to be anything other than neoliberal in its very intention, in its absolute heart. And that it is a crisis so severe inside the Eurozone, certainly inside the periphery of the Eurozone, a point I return to, that, uh, that it has to be described as a crisis of neoliberalism as well, that the institutions are thrown into crisis uh, because of this. And that boils down to, I think, two things. The first part is what was hardwired into the Maastricht Treaty, confirmed by the Lisbon, Lisbon Treaty thereafter, which is the liberalisation of financial and money markets inside the Eurozone. That from 1992 and confirmed into the 2000s, the entire march of how you would establish a single currency, a major plank of the entire project, was for European ruling classes to look at that point at Britain and America and saying, aren't they doing well with their big financial systems? This is how we can also do well. This is how we can liberalise and reinvigorate our economies. This is what's providing a dynamism to the Anglo-Saxon world that we Europeans lack. Uh, so you liberalise your financial systems, this is of course argued for very, very heavily by the major banks to benefit enormously from this process. You allow a far greater range of, of cross-national uh, transactions to take place, you allow mergers to take place across nations, you allow deals to take place, you get rid of, and in fact you make illegal under European law, any idea that you might have controls on the movement of capital, for instance, across national borders, you deliberately set all this thing up to liberalise financial systems. Key element of neoliberalism. The other part of neoliberalism, of course, is the creation of the euro as a system of fixed exchange rates. That if you join the euro at one exchange rate, you were, once you're inside the euro, locked into that exchange rate and your control over your own monetary policy as a nation state would be removed and handed over to the European Central Bank. Um, this has very important consequences I'll come back to, but this is critical to the neoliberalism of the euro. It's critical to it for reasons that, that were identified way, way back in the past actually by uh, one of the godfathers, and that probably is the best word for him, uh, one of the godfathers of neoliberalism, Friedrich uh, von Hayek, writing in the 30s, um, who describes as one of a set of various proposals that he has to deal with the crash at the time, who describes the potential creation of a single currency for Europe 
as a means to remove the influence of European populations on markets and on the economy. And his argument is essentially that all these countries compete, there is no European democracy, there is no European expression of a collective will, therefore any European-wide or Europe-wide institution to manage the economy will be free from the taint of collectivism and democracy, it will have to be purely technical, it will therefore impose plain and simply the demands of the market and therefore we have to, as far as possible, create a European currency that is and has no attachment to uh, any kind of European democracy, which is of course precisely uh, what we end up with. Uh, and he was always going to be a little bit like that. The, the EU is not uh, a democratic institution in any useful or, or worthwhile sense, and it never has been, and, and frankly, almost certainly, it is never going to be. But this is the essential neoliberal uh, content of the, the Eurozone. Now, it plays out like this. The, the actual features of the crisis start to look a little bit like this. That 2008, crisis breaks out everywhere. Governments, as is very well known by this point, uh, respond in more, actually Britain sets a lead on it, but respond in more or less the same way everywhere, which is to see your entire banking system uh, close to disappearing into a gaping abyss. Um, there is a, a wonderful description um, by a British journalist, Andrew Rawnsley, in his account of Gordon Brown's unhappy time as Prime Minister, in which he talks about the heads of the five largest British banks going to see Alistair Darling, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister, uh, at the time, a week after Lehman Brothers has collapsed, and the heads of the five largest British banks, I think two, three of which still now exist, uh, go and see Alistair Darling and say that, look, unless you bail us out, uh, this is on the Sunday following, unless you bail us out, we on Monday morning will have to close our branches and shut down our ATM machines because we will have run out of, of money at this point. Now, there's an element to which that is simply blackmail, that, that you know, if you're a major bank and you threaten this sort of thing, you can't have a government over a barrel, uh, at least if it's as spineless as Gordon Brown's government was. Uh, and there's also a large element of truth, that this was the largest bank run in history, Vast amounts of credit were disappearing from the core uh, banks of the core economies. There had to be something done. The option that was taken, and there were others, but they were never seriously discussed, uh, was to bail out the banks. Uh, a vastly expensive um, operation. Uh, the IMF estimated cost to be about $11 trillion worldwide. This is a colossal chunk of world GDP handed over to the banking system to prop them up, which has the immediate effect of taking public sector balance sheets and expanding them enormously, of taking a load of uh, private sector bad debt and transforming it into public sector debt. Better quality public sector debt, but debt nonetheless. So debt's everywhere. Public debt's everywhere go through the roof. That's allied to, at the same time, a very, very sharp uh, recession right the way across the world, particularly severe where countries have financialised most radically, so Britain, again, Ireland would be another good example of the same process, very, very sharp recession, which has the inevitable result of driving up unemployment, so driving up what governments have to spend on unemployment benefits, at the same time as pushing down tax receipts because there's less money circulating in the economy. So deficits also automatically widen. This happens 2008 into 2009. That happens essentially across the developed world, certainly takes place inside the Eurozone. Now what happens inside the Eurozone is at this point critical. You have uh, banks, European banks, believing that governments like those of Greece and of Spain and of Portugal, because they are Euro members, can never default on their, on their debt. They can take on debt and they will never default on that debt because the structure of the Eurozone, which means, in fact, Germany, the structure of this Eurozone will be such that they are not able, they will not be allowed to default on their debt, and therefore any lending to these countries is exactly as risky, which is to say not very risky at all, as lending to Germany or Denmark or Finland, Germany in particular. So they're more than happy to finance the accelerating public debt of Eurozone members, including those southern uh, European um, 
now heavily indebted Eurozone members because they believe that no default can happen. And they maintain this happy illusion uh, until October 2009, when a new Greek government is elected uh, that opens the books and, and very rapidly realises that the previous government uh, had, in, in what is something of a tradition really, uh, had been fiddling the debt figures, the public debt figures for Greece, and Greece's public debt was massively higher uh, than anyone really anticipated. Um, cue panic. Cue absolute abject panic in the part of all those European banks who had happily lent that debt in the first place because they're now sitting on immense piles of assets that they thought were safe and are now very risky and could, just as they did just a year before in 2008, essentially turn worthless overnight. So panic uh, ensues. That's one part of it. The other part of it is tied to the system of fixed exchange rates, the kind of neoliberal project that, that the Eurozone is, the system of fixed exchange rates, implicit fixed exchange rates that operate inside uh, the Eurozone over the period of its, of its existence, that essentially, you, to put it in a rather condensed form, you had the southern European countries, Greece, Spain, Portugal, um, sort of arguably Italy, but certainly those those pigs, so-called, throwing Ireland as well, uh, joined the Eurozone at uh, too high a rate relative to Germany and some of northern European countries who joined at a too low a rate relative to what would have been ideal for a sort of notional uh, levels of productivity, a kind of ideal had the markets been allowed to sort this one out at some point. They're in a fixed exchange rate system and they maintain that for, for 10 years or so. Now what happens if you have an exchange rate that is continually relatively overvalued is that you find that your imports from everywhere else are relatively cheap, but it's difficult for you to export. So you buy more uh, from abroad and you sell far less to abroad. The flip side of it, of course, is if your exchange rate is continually undervalued, you sell less uh, you buy less from abroad, but you sell far more into abroad. And this happens inside the Eurozone. The fixed exchange rate system ties Germany with an undervalued exchange rate into southern Europe with an overvalued exchange rate, and you end up with this enormous deficit in southern Europe opening up, as they always buy more, essentially, from northern Europe than they can export to northern Europe, and the reverse happening in, in uh, northern Europe. This is the, the real driver of the surplus and deficit countries we see inside the Eurozone. You get deficits, huge trade deficits opening up uh, in southern Europe. You get enormous trade surpluses starting to peer within the Eurozone uh, in northern Europe, led of course by Germany in this instance. The key feature here is that you cannot run a trade deficit forever. You can't always buy more from abroad without selling as much to abroad unless somebody pays for it. And the mechanism for paying for it was to take the surpluses from Northern Europe, recycle them through your liberalized financial system as debt, which arrives in Southern Europe. So there's this kind of completely irrational circuit, unstable circuit is established in which surpluses, trade surpluses in the North are recycled through the neoliberal financial system of the single currency into debt, which pays for deficits developing in the South. And that's where you get the real debt crisis from. It is not fundamentally a crisis of public spending. If you take God, Portugal, Spain and Ireland, all of them were running uh, government surpluses. The government was spending less and it was getting in taxes prior to the crash. It is not a crisis of public spending. It is a crisis driven by a structural and institutional imbalance inside the single currency itself. This rumbles on, smacks into the wider debt crisis, and then hence you get the focus of the global crisis, this global kind of malaise that we're, we're living through taking place inside the Eurozone itself. So panic ensues. The financial markets drop their happy belief that, that Greece, or at least the Greek government, is a safer bet to lend to uh, as Germany, um, largely because it becomes very apparent that Greece's debt is unstable and, and unpayable and is not going to be paid at, at any plausible point into the future. You get a succession of failed initiatives by the Troika, uh, they managed to pick a, a deeply sinister name, um, of the IMF, the EU, and the European Central Bank, who do a, a combination of imposing austerity on one side 
and then running bailouts, so-called bailouts, for the stricken governments and the other. The key to this, of course, is that the bailouts first are not uh, bailouts for, certainly not for ordinary Greeks or, or ordinary uh, Portuguese, that these are not going to help out anybody in the sense of, you know, giving them a better standard of living or allowing them to keep hospitals open, that these are bailouts that go straight to the government so the government can immediately repay its creditors. Who are those creditors? Of course, they are the major European banks located in Northern Europe who had spent the decade before piling up debt into Southern Europe in the first place. That's the, the logic of the bailouts overseen by the EU and the ECB over the last few years, and I dare say continuing uh, over the next year or so. The other side of it is austerity. Austerity, to be absolutely clear about this, there is no real macroeconomic justification for imposing austerity. The, the reason is simple, it's known since at least the 1930s, since at least uh, Keynes, kind of John Maynard Keynes formalised it, uh, which boils down to a simple argument that, that if you take a whole economy, whatever I spend is inevitably, necessarily, what you earn. Otherwise it's not me spending, it's me doing something else. If I spend money, someone else earns money. If I cut my spending, someone else must be earning less. If everyone cuts their spending, everybody else must be earning less. This is the logic of recession that we can see playing out at the moment. If government, therefore, faced with a recession, cuts its spending at the same time as everybody else is cutting its spending, the recession gets worse. And the recession has got uh, dramatically worse in the case of uh, Greece, spectacularly so, less so in Ireland and certainly now in Spain and Portugal uh, as well. Britain has a similar process taking place in which, despite not being in the Eurozone, we have a government, for its own reasons, deeply uh, committed to austerity, deeply committed to pushing back in public expenditure and driving the economy into a succession uh, of recessions as a result. So that's the, that's the macroeconomic impact of uh, austerity. The real reason you're doing it, to put it crudely, is that if nothing else, austerity means that you privilege financial assets and the holders of financial assets above anybody else in the economy. That you say, we don't care how much real activity we kill off, we don't care how bad unemployment gets and how miserable everybody is. The first priority is always to repay your creditors. That's the mechanism of austerity. So it locks again also into the mechanism of the bailouts. The bailouts are there not to bail out the states, still less to bail out the people, they're there to bail out the major European banks, and the logic of austerity is to tie those states, and therefore those people, into ensuring the banks can always be, be repaid. The, this is the entire drive behind uh, what's taking place in the Eurozone at the moment. And it doesn't particularly work over the first few years. It doesn't work at all. Uh, at all well. Very obviously so in the case of Greece. Uh, at the start of the crisis, Greece's debt to GDP ratio at the end of 2009 was about 120%. So 20% oh, more as national debt than what it generated in a year as output. Um, fast forward, what is it now? Well, approaching four years, but really three years down the line, you're looking at a debt that is on some projections approaching 160% of GDP. So it's gone from 120 to 160%, despite all the attempts at, at bailouts and austerity programs and all the rest of it. But essentially, the economy is being driven backwards. And what you start to see emerging within this, and I'll come back to the point, is something that runs completely contrary to what the not just the Eurozone always claimed to be, but actually the European Union, at least notionally, always claimed to be, which was that it was uh, an equality between states of at least some sort. That this was a, a free and equal association of people who were now considering themselves to be each other's equals, at least at a level of national states, and would therefore bargain with each other on an equal level. Um, the Eurozone is set up in the same way, everybody gets the same interest rate, Everybody gets the same currency, the same currency is worth the same amount, the same rules apply throughout the entire uh, place, and everybody gets a vote in, in determining how things operate. And instead of that, you get uh, a pronounced hierarchy emerging inside uh, the Eurozone itself, with countries like Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland very much on the wrong end of that hierarchy, and countries like Germany in particular uh, at the, precisely uh, the other end of it that you get this creation of a deeply unequal relationship appearing inside the Eurozone that is frankly akin to very old relationships of empire and colonization that would be familiar uh, with from, from the 19th century. Now, of course, this isn't to uh, 
to exaggerate the impact of this, but nonetheless the process of hierarchies determined by politics and determined by relationships between states is a familiar one in capitalism. It's not an unusual thing to occur. It is fairly unusual to see it appearing inside this neoliberal project, inside this supposedly free and equal association of the EU uh, and of the Eurozone. So that's one part of it. The final bit, and the bit we're coming to, is that the ECB eventually, the European Central Bank eventually, uh, realises the depths of the crisis that they've wandered into, or got themselves into, and offers to print money uh, forevermore. This is the, uh, this is the, got the, I forget the name of it, the, 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 it was initially the long-term refinancing operation, and it's now chosen to call itself uh, the OMT and some other combination of initials. I think it's being dragged up for the next round of refinancing uh, across the Eurozone. Essentially an operation in which the ECB says we will supply cheap credit uh, right the way across the Eurozone in as great a quantities as required to stabilise the situation. Now, this isn't quite printing money uh, in the hope of staving off a crisis, but it is dangerously, uh, dangerously uh, close to precisely doing that. And, of course, there's, there's two sort of dangers involved here. One is that the European Central Bank, by printing money on a grand scale, or doing something that's getting dangerously close to simply printing money, um, is inflating its own balance sheet. It's taking on lots and lots of liabilities. It's saying it will soak up uh, bad debts and risks from right the way across the rest of the Eurozone without, and this is critical to a kind of failing of the entire system, I suppose, the European Central Bank in particular, without having a state behind it that can guarantee the central bank's own liabilities. Most central banks have a state behind it which in the end can guarantee the money will be worth something. At the very minimum, you can use it to pay taxes or whatever. There is a state there to prop the thing up. If you have a European Central Bank that floats above lots of different states, it is completely unclear if or when its liabilities turn ropey, if the risks develop, if it starts to find itself in a, a bad situation facing lots of financial risk, it's not clear who carries the can for it at all, which is precisely the fear that now exercises uh, that more conservative section of the German ruling class, uh, that they will have to carry the can for this thing. And it's one thing to bail out your own banks, um, every so often. It's another thing to have to bail out everybody else's banks. This is, of course, also the reason that proposals for a banking union for joint regulation of banks across the Eurozone are also starting to fall apart. Because the question of who carries the can in the absence of a state is, is simply uh, not clear. So that's, that's where we get to at the moment. That we're running up hard, I think, against both the institutional features of the crisis, in the very widest sense, of course, the crisis of neoliberalism, the problem that remains of a system dragged down by bad debt, and then in the, Euro, in the Eurozone itself, a failure of a particular form of neoliberalism in the single currency, allied to a wider, I think, and deeper failing of the European its Union itself as, uh, a, as a, you know, a, an equal association, uh, as a transnational association, turning into something uh, far more far more threatening and unpleasant, I think, that also incidentally calls into question some of the, the kind of foundational principles of why the Euro, or at least the European Union, and its forerunner institutions have been supported. The argument was never that these would provide you with democracy or representation, or that these express some, I don't know, European character. I mean, you can try saying that, but no one ever really bought it. Uh, there's no democracy, there's no representation, but at least over the post-war period, what it would give you is prosperity. Millwood, uh, Millwood, Alan Millwood, very great historian of the European Union, the European institutions, called it the rescue of the nation state, that coming out of the Second World War, that there had to be a better promise than the failed promises of the nation states that had taken Europe into the war. And so instead you get an argument, well, we can deliver prosperity, we can create a common economic framework, and for 30, 40 years it works. It mutates into a neoliberal framework, which appears to work for a decade under particularly the single currency, that neoliberal framework has now collapsed, and potentially also the very structure and logic for having a European Union that was structured as something at the very least, no democracy, but you get prosperity. It now looks like no democracy and you don't get prosperity, either into something that loses much of its claim to any kind of legitimacy uh, across the continent there. Those are the two dimensions of, of, of the, the crisis as it manifests itself in Europe. The third one, of course, is, is the broader one, which is, uh, look, if, you, if you're going to talk about 
prosperity of any sort, at least since the Second World War, this meant that you delivered economic growth. This meant you always got economic growth. You always got, you always got uh, an expansion of the economy of some sort, that if you got the expansion of the economy, you could then also get a welfare state, free education, expansion of university education, national health service in Britain, health insurance elsewhere, a list of historic demands largely of the labour movements in Europe are provided by economic growth, relatively consistent economic growth from the Second World War, uh, without getting into the very tangled and necessarily sometimes bloody arguments over redistribution that otherwise started to bedevil capitalism in the interwar period. That if if you like the pie, instead of arguing over where the slices land, you simply make the pie a bit bigger and then you can ignore who's getting the biggest slice because you will still have more in the future. That once you no longer have a pie that gets bigger in the future, the arguments over redistribution start to reassert themselves in a very, very deep way, which is an argument that social democracy in Europe and the social democratic parties in Europe and the institutions of social democracy have never seriously had to confront that, at least in France and Germany and the, the kind of core organised core states of the European Union, has always been tied to a European project as well, which is itself now going to crisis. If that growth is now not occurring on a very wide scale, and we can of course argue about the reasons for this, but the evidence points to, or is starting to point to, a serious long-term slowdown in not just the average annual rate of growth, but the trend rate of growth for the developed economies. Now, you can suggest that there are environmental limits to this, the pressing resource costs, uh, that if you're an old-fashioned Marxist, in many ways I am, then an explanation that revolves around the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and the structure of institutions in capitalism, the way capitalism ages over time, and the way it loses its dynamic over time is also uh, critical um, to, to this one. Then as growth uh, slows down, social democracy is pushed into a crisis. Most obviously, I think, if you want to see political consequences of this, most obviously its political manifestation is appearing, I think, in Greece, where the relatively new, but nonetheless very well implanted, would get 40 to 50 percent of the vote, uh, party of social democracy, PASOK, has entirely disintegrated, almost entirely disintegrated, in the last few years, uh, now down to about 8% of, uh, of the vote there, to be replaced by, or largely replaced by, because there's a, a downside of course to this, a very, very sharp downside, to be largely replaced by a far more radical formation that contains within it those arguing for a more radical transformation, not just of Greece, but of, but of all of capitalism, potentially an end to capitalism, in the form of Syriza. That the crisis of growth produces a crisis of European institutions, produces a crisis, therefore, of social democracy, and so the possibility for a radical alternative opens. Of course, it is not only the left and progressives who sense this possibility for a radical alternative. The rise of Golden Dawn in Greece is exactly the other side of this disintegration of the core promise of both social democracy and the European institutions. So that, I think, is, is where we get to today. Um, that the prospects get, getting out of this one, the prospects coming out of this one are on one level very bleak, essentially, for most people across most of Europe at, at this point in time. That a major institutional crisis does not look any closer to being resolved at the level of European institutions and therefore at the level of European uh, states. That no doubt we'll sort of drift along a bit long before anything truly catastrophic manages to occur, but that's not a good place to find yourself in if you're on the receiving end of kind of endless austerity, terminal declines in your standard of living, uh, continually elevated unemployment, particularly for the young, and the general sense of deepening malaise. That's one side of it. The other side of it is, of course, in the crisis of social democracy, of the European institutions, of even the European states themselves, there is a prospect that opens up there for far more radical formations to appear, far more radical political organisations to appear of the left, if they can, I think, present a case for the defence of what social democracy delivered, a defence of the existing claims to welfare uh, that we have, the existing claims to, uh, you know, 
something approaching a humane standard of living are lied to an insistent demand for redistribution, to take from the 1% and spread amongst the 99%. And that these two things put together, if formulated in a popular way, if aligned to a mass movement, if placed in the context of a disintegration or a creeping disintegration of social democracy, has a potential, I think, to, to be really uh, transformational, certainly for Europe, potentially for the world. All right, thank you. Thank you, James, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, now it's uh, time for the debate, so if you have any comments, questions, just speak up. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned that the ECB is now uh, engaged in uh, printing of money. Um, I, I don't quite understand what you mean by uh, the fear of liabilities or some such thing, and take on so much risk that it can, I mean, it's, it's, if it's printing money, it's always going to be able to pay it, or, or am I mistaken? Right, sure. Come back to that now? Yeah, all right. Um, well, on that one quickly, I mean, first one is, is it's not quite, I mean, there are always sort of variants in the theme of, oh, they're printing money. Uh, quantitative easing everywhere is not quite printing money, not quite printing money. Uh, not least because you know, we don't really print that much actual folding papery uh, stuff anymore. Um, and what the ECB is doing through the long-term refinancing operation and similar schemes, um, the OMT being the most recent, is not quite quantitative easing. But what it is doing is offering um, credit at a very, very cheap rate right the way across Europe, and in particular to European banks, through the national central banks um, as a means of supporting their lending operations. So it's not quite money, it's not quite high-powered money in the sense we normally think of it, but it's very, very cheap credit indeed. Now the problem with that is, is that this is the ECB adding to its own balance sheet. It's, it's creating what look like uh, assets over here and liabilities in the form of the additional credit over there. It's creating these additional potential risks for itself because it does not know whether those cheap loans will be repaid even at the minimal rates that they're being offered at. It, it just doesn't know that. But Which means that it, it, it can't quite print money. This is the, the critical bit. It could then say, okay, we don't know whether the thing can be repaid, so we can print money to compensate for, for the risk of it not being returned. We can just literally just print money. We'll just go to the, the Greek banks and say, look, we'll just add a naught at the end of your, your bank accounts and you're all richer. Right. In theory, of course, it, it can do this. In practice, the, the, the decisive issue with the ECB is that it has no state behind it to guarantee that the money is ever worth anything. Most, in fact, all other central banks, I think the ECB is essentially unique in history in this, all other central banks have a state which, in the end, can guarantee that its money must be worth something, even if it's not worth very much, because bluntly it has a monopoly on violence. It can force you to accept the money and it can force you to give that money to the state to pay taxes it demands of you. So it can force a value ultimately on uh, what that money is actually worth. The ECB doesn't have that option. The ECB doesn't have that option which means that when it stacks up assets and liabilities, when its balance sheet expands in the way it has been expanding, it isn't clear who carries the ultimate risk for making sure those liabilities are worth anything. It isn't clear amongst who of the member states would actually have to pay for a bank that defaulted on some ECB debt, for example. And it's also not clear who it would be that would ultimately enforce the value of the euro in extremis, if you were just going to go and print money and try and enforce the value. So, short of actually invading somewhere and making this happen, which to me doesn't seem quite likely yet. Yes, that's the external value of the thing, but we're talking about the internal set of relationships. There's an internal domestic effect of the economy here. So we all use a euro for our day-to-day -day transactions inside the eurozone, and then there's a kind of external value it acquires relative to where, everywhere else in the world. Now that will vary depending on what happens domestically. If the, if the euro looks, if the European Central Bank prints a load of euro notes, almost certainly the value externally will collapse, for example. But that may say nothing about what's happening domestically. 
you might get hyperinflation, you might not, you probably won't. Why but, doesn't that happen in the States? Why, because what you've got in the States is a central federal government that enforces taxes, that guarantees the money, that guarantees ultimately the liabilities of the central bank. It says that, look, we will carry the can. If you lot can't actually repay these things, uh, if there's defaults happening left, right and centre, we ultimately guarantee that the money that the central bank is issuing is actually worth something. There's no state that can do that inside Europe. So there's a kind of critical weakness at the heart here. If you wanted to approach something like the states, you could, and people keep talking about this, but it looks unlikely to ever quite happen, you could move towards a fiscal union. You could centralise the collection of taxes and centralise expenditure. And that way, have something that started to look like a state that could guarantee uh, the liabilities of the European Central Bank, that could guarantee ultimately the value of its money. And that would overcome the problem that the European Central Bank are the worst faces. And then you could do quantitative easing properly, and you could just print money. There would be other risks involved, but you could do that. But to get to the point at which all the Eurozone members say, we will remove our control over our own tax and spending powers and transfer them somewhere else, is, I think, a deeply fraught process. Politically, it just doesn't look like it's going to happen. The closest you've got to it is a kind of simulation of that in the fiscal compact, uh, in the deal done at the end of 2011, December 2011, where everyone agrees to try and balance their budgets forever, forevermore. Some of the thinking behind this is precisely to make it look like you've got a kind of stable fiscal agreement. In practice, you still haven't really, so in practice, it's still... Is that, is that answering? Yeah. Okay, good. Context of what you just said uh, by uh, European Central Bank uh, not being backed up by uh, any state. So, uh, do you see uh, these? I don't know a lot of suggestions for mutualizing the European debt and covering it with uh, issuing of uh, ECB bonds or uh, euro bonds feasible in any way? I mean, of course, there's one option where uh, I know this issuing could be covered or backed by the sovereign states, but then also the spreads would, uh, I mean, would, uh, would, would, uh, would rise uh, substantially because it would be a kind of an average of uh, uh, sovereign uh, uh, bond spreads uh, throughout the Eurozone, but uh, there's also an option for ECB to issue bonds on its own behalf. Do you think that is feasible in any way uh, before, uh, I mean, in, in, in this condition where uh, Europe is not uh, kind of a federation or uh, a sovereign political entity by itself. Well, it, it, it can do it. In theory, at least, uh, the European Central Bank can issue issue its own bonds. I'm just simply right. And, it, and it's some of ways doing sort of approaches some of that, but it never quite gets there. And it never quite gets there precisely for the reason that there's no there's no single state to guarantee the bonds in this case. There's, there's no guarantee that you... Um, lending money to, to this institution, you don't know in the end that someone's going to be able to repay it. A government can always repay you because in the end it does literally pin, print money that is definitely guaranteed to be worth something because it also enforces taxes paid in that money. So so that's the reason that, that you can't quite make the Eurobonds work properly. Now it could in theory issue them, but what you suspect will happen... Would you issue like a tax-backed uh, Eurobonds? Yeah, you'd, you could, that, that would be, you see, that would be an option. Then you'd have to create some kind of, of additional vehicle that all European countries guarantee that it will give a, a definite, fixed, legally, possibly constitutionally fixed chunk of their tax revenues into, and that will pay in over here, and then you could write bonds out of this. Now, there are institutions that look a little bit like that. The, the various stability mechanisms have that kind of character about them. The European Stability Mechanism, the European Financial Stability um, Fund, facility, yeah, not fund because it's not quite a fund, which is critical, have something of that character about them, in that the various member states say, okay, we will, if necessary, um, summon up a, a huge amount of money to pay for bailing out some state in crisis elsewhere. Um, they don't, as things stand, actually put any money into this, they just write a promise that they will put money into this. Now, the problem you've got there, of course, is the states that are paying into the fund to bail out the states in crisis are, of course, also the states that potentially go into crisis. So immediately the thing is a lot weaker than it ought to be. If it was possible to create some fund, not a facility, but a fund, uh, over time that everyone was paying money into, like the IMF or something, then that would be a stock of cash that you could mobilise. The problem there, of course, is that, as we know, bailing out a large developed country, or even 
a large developed country's banking system is phenomenally expensive. So to build up the kind of resources you want would require an immediate transfer of real resources from European countries into this pot, which may then never get used. Now, I, I don't see a government out there that's going to argue at this point in time, or indeed any point in time, that we should all sort of stick our cash into a piggy bank that we may have to pay to someone else. That, by the way, we've been demonising for the last four years as workshop scroungers who brought it on themselves, who spent all day lazing around eating olives or whatever the list of stereotypes is. Uh, about Greece. So it's not, it's not going to happen like that. The other thing, of course, is the international political economy part of it, is that the IMF would not be happy and has not been happy about anyone setting up anything that looks like uh, a rival to, to, its own, uh, to its own ability to be the ultimate lender of last resort. It is not happy. It was not happy about proposals floated by Japan after the East Asian crisis. Uh, to set up a kind of Asian monetary fund to deal with just crises in that region. It has, over the period since that time, been weakened as an institution, so things, institutions elsewhere in the world have developed, like the Banco del Sur uh, for South America, have developed, which start to take on IMF-like qualities. They're, they're pots of cash to deal with currency crises within single regions. IMF has been significantly undermined over uh, the last decade or so, until, of course, the European crisis came along, at which point it can ride in, you know, like a knight on, on a white charger, and sort out everything for Europe. So the obvious, very obvious institutional um, bias of the IMF will be very much against seeing anything like a European monetary fund being established. And therefore it almost certainly won't happen, because Europe needs the IMF to pay for all the bailouts. So it's a, it's a total fucking mess, is it? It's short memory. Anything else? Questions? Okay, I think I have another one. Uh, concerning the uh, exchange rate uh, policy of the euro, uh, how would you comment these uh, recent uh, suggestions for a more coordinated uh, European, uh, I mean, Eurozone exchange rate policy, which was uh, recently uh, put forth, uh, obviously, by France, since uh, France, uh, as opposed to Germany, has a, a rather large uh, current account. Uh, deficit, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, I'm well aware that it wouldn't uh, solve any uh, architectural or institutional problems of the Eurozone, but do you think uh, this would be at least uh, a small step uh, forward or not? It, well, the trouble with the the, the, the... the Eurozone involves a system of fixed relative exchange rates inside the Eurozone itself. Yeah. The countries all sort of appear effectively at different rates of exchange inside the Eurozone. It then also has an external exchange rate, which is how much the euro is worth relative to every other currency on the planet. Now, because there is a structure inside, everybody's ideal value of what the euro should therefore be worth varies somewhat. And within countries, it will vary somewhat depending on who you are. If you're a German bank, your inclination is to drive the euro up uh, as high as possible effectively, because this gives you a very, very powerful stable currency with which, with which to conduct your operations, and you can attract funds from the rest of the world on the basis that you're dealing in euros, and therefore a high-value euro is definitely good for you. If you're a German manufacturer, you want precisely the opposite, which is why, incidentally, you're, you're quite happy to carry on keeping Greece, uh, Portugal, and Spain, and Ireland inside the eurozone, because it undermines the value of the currency and therefore you can carry on exporting wildly into China and East Asia in particular. And that's part of your kind of export-led view of the world. Now, as things stand, that view is probably winning out, uh, certainly inside the German ruling class. It's less clear where other countries might actually like that. In the case of Greece, it's perfectly obvious they should just get out of Europe full stop. Uh, Italy looks like a, a similar case for, for leaving the euro, largely because it, its cost of exit would be, I think, much lesser than Greece. It's a much larger, more independent uh, economy that's obviously suffering greatly from being inside the eurozone. Um, but then how that translates into which way you would like the currency to go in the markets is, is not. You're back into the problem of complexity and conflicting demands within the, within the eurozone. The, these are, in the end, competing nation states. They are not even got to the level of organisation and collective thinking, collective organisation that a standard capitalist nation state has got to. It remains uh, a band of warring brothers and the occasional sister, if you're talking about how the Eurozone uh, 
operates at, at, the, at the very top of the thing. And therefore, you can't immediately and clearly resolve the issue of what your ideal currency rate would be because everybody just squabbles for everyone. And that's exactly what you saw happening with Hollande, who takes one view of it, versus Merkel, who takes another one. Isn't it also a major problem in the monetary union that you can have one recipe for all the states? Because every has another economic situation, uh, manufacturing situation, whatever. And not you're just governed, but really by the German manufacturing elite and banking elite. No, I agree. It's uh, I mean, what what's what was supposed to happen was convergence. And this is a lovely idea that, that if you just by some miracle of the free market, if you give everyone the same currency, they'll all end up being pretty much the same everywhere. And, and for a while, you can delude yourself like this. You know, if you take the ten years from ten ish years from 1999 to the crisis breaking out in 2009, Germany doesn't grow that much. It sort of fools along, but it's not doing particularly well. Uh, Greece really booms, apparently. GDP goes through the roof, you know, same Spain, Portugal, Ireland. It looks like convergence. If one of them's not growing much and the other's growing fast, they catch up. And then suddenly everywhere is as rich as Frankfurt or whatever. Um, what's happened since the crisis is precisely the opposite mechanism has kicked in. That con divergence is taking place on a very, very wide scale, which is where you get the appearance of the core and periphery relationship emerging inside uh, inside the EU. Now, so the reason it works in two different ways, I think, is precisely due to the fact that you can't set your own interest rate, you can't set your own exchange rate policy, you have limited control over uh, fiscal policy, you have limited control over how your government is allowed to intervene anywhere uh, in the country, and actually you're dealing with several very different economies. Though when things are going well, they pull together, when things are going badly, they fall apart again. I mean, even the US states have, like, yeah. this problem. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, they have also, like, different, different inside policies, uh, the different like uh, and so on. Yes. So. But they can they can overcome they it can, yeah. because it's it's a it's a fiscal union. It's you have a national government which can take taxes from the rich bits the and give them to the poor bits. Uh, or then noticeably, you know, everybody votes in, in the opposite direction to that. The poorer bits who get the taxes all vote Republican. The richer bits all vote uh, a Democrat. But you know that's the American political system for you. Um, but yeah, you could do that if you had a European state. But a very large part of the problem here is that we don't, and nor are we likely to get one, not this side of capitalism at least. I mean, the first one is, is that the, the rise in inequality, there's, there's a quite a good paper, bizarrely, by one of the IMS of chief researchers, um, Michael Kumhoff, uh, from a couple of years ago, that had quite a neat modelling of the link between um, rising income inequality, rising debt, and therefore financial fragility and crash on the other side. That, Essentially, the model, his model, I think it fairly accurately describes the boom, is that you have a group of people at the top who are, oh, are very asset rich, who then loan their money to people at the bottom who are seeing their income steadily decline, income equality, uh, inequality widens, the debt grows and grows, and eventually the thing crashes, which is more or less exactly what happens. So there's a definite relationship between rising inequality and financial fragility and the propensity of the system to crash. Um, what, at least in Britain, and I think uh, across much of the rest of Europe that's been unusual about this recession, is that generally recessions 
not always, but generally they have a, something of a slowdown impact on inequality. They tend to pull things somewhat, at least as far as you can measure it, somewhat closer together again, because people have a, a kind of floor income. Once you have a welfare state, there's a floor income at the bottom here. Um, if you're in a recession, asset values don't rise as much, so the rich aren't getting quite as rich as they used to be. Uh, and so everybody gets kind of slightly more equal. It's not necessarily pleasant, but you're a bit more equal at least. What's happening in this recession is exactly the opposite, which is that asset values held, obviously, by the rich, you know, they have more assets, that's why they're rich, are continuing to rise, particularly in property, um, and somewhat in, in stock values as well, depending on where you are. Uh, whilst everybody else is seeing their real incomes, which is what they depend on, if you're asset poor, you depend on your immediate income, continues to slide downwards somewhere. So the effect is working the opposite direction. Now, as far as I'm aware, the, the impact that's actually had on consumer spending is that consumer spending has been pulled right back everywhere. And that is one of the key parts in driving the recession, precisely because of the mechanism. If I cut my spending, you cut your spending, someone else earns less. So you get a recession if everybody starts to cut their spending. Uh, and that's what's driving the decline in GDP, the collapse of growth and, and the rest of it uh, over here. Within that, there are some unusual impacts in that uh, this is again an exaggeration of what's taken place over the last 10 years or so, is that the price and if you like, the price divided by quality or, or however you want to express it, the relative price of manufactured goods, so things like the camera here, or, or you know, your computer or whatever, has collapsed in value. Uh, so the price of one-off goods has fallen and fallen, continues to fall, while the price of things you have to buy all the time, so food and energy being the most obvious ones, and then probably also housing, uh, continues to rise and rise. So the impact on people's living standards of this is that although there's a kind of semblance of prosperity, you can think, God, I can buy a plasma TV screen for like 10 quid or more than that, but you know, it, eventually you'll presumably get to that point. Uh, the, these things are cheap, you can buy trinkets, you just can't afford to heat your house. So it's a really peculiar uh, world that, that we're getting into in that. And of course, at the same time, everybody's overloaded, certainly in Britain, certainly across the, the sort of neoliberalized world, absolutely overloaded with debt at this point and are desperately trying to repay it, which is another reason they're bringing back in their spending. They probably won't be able to repay those debts. And I think one of the demands that could usefully emerge uh, right the way across Europe, and it's starting to appear in America as well, is the demand to start cancelling debts, the demand for a debt jubilee. That essentially you've got debt that to a very large extent is something like odious. They should never have been taken on in the first place. And that is getting worse as a crisis develops because of course one response to falling incomes is that you desperately borrow more from worse lenders at higher rates of interest to try and stay in the same place. You know, so there's a shift, I don't know if you have it here, into the kind of payday loans and the kind of internet lenders where you just log in and in five five minutes you can borrow 500 quid and the, the, the interest rate is 4,000%, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, this is something that people are turning increasingly to because banks the kind of official lenders are saying, well, you've got far too much debt and you don't have very much money, so we're not going to lend to you, so you have to go somewhere else. So the, the, all the bad features of the boom are actually getting worse and worse as things go on. One of the demands we could usually raise is a cancellation, not so much of government debt, which in most places, Greece is something of an exception, simply isn't that much of a problem. I mean, whatever the, the kind of fuss made about it, just not really that high anywhere. Um, in, inside, of, inside of Europe. Um, but the cancellation of private debts and household debts, I think, will be a useful thing to raise. It's already started to happen. I, uh, Iceland, um, the government there recently enacted a law, in fact, it's the last year, which cancelled a fair chunk of people's uh, mortgage debts, which instantly made some sort of instantly put some more stable financial footing. Charles Adonis, today we will be able to do a lot of work in the next few days. I was going to ask you about the next few days, but I didn't write it. I gave the Bojo Repe, it was the fourth day, here in the middle of the time, the next few days, the European integration, the revision of the buildings and the new against fascism. I was going to be able to see you later on and buy naše zbornike, borca in pač nekatere knjige založbe Sofija oziroma založbe naprej. Ok, thanks again, James.